We are empowered by lay-driven leadership, connecting lay ministries and business people to share Christ in the marketplace in support of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Good morning, ASI family, and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Sabbath School. Hey, Debbie, I don't think they were with us. You might try that again. Good morning. Happy hey, Sabbath. Yeah. Happy Sabbath. So um, just want to give you, before we have our prayer this morning, um, a little bit of insight into what's happening at ASI Southern Union. So guys, tell me what's going on. Well, Debbie, this uh, last year we decided we needed to remember our youth as an ASI organization partnering with the church, not just to be supporting ministries, but to take hold and connect with our church. So um, ASI had our spring retreat in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, which is part of the Georgia Cumberland Conference. Elder Gary Rustad is with us this morning, the president of Georgia Cumberland Conference. So Gary, we uh, ventured into some of the communities around Gatlinburg, and we kind of set some pretty high marks for the future. So tell us a little bit about what happened. You know, we're excited to have ASI coming to Gatlinburg, and we realize the potential in Gatlinburg is huge. One of the cities that has a lot of the employees that work in Gatlinburg is Newport, Tennessee. And so ASI Southern Union teamed up with our local Newport church and had a health expo. It was exciting as we had community members come in to the expo, and we still have some that are coming to church from that expo. Amen. Amen. Uh, what, what are we thinking about down the road? I mean, we, we started thinking further than just uh, visiting and having a few come to church. Well, I have a dream that we have something there in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. You know, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, 14.1 million visitors in 2021 came to the Smoky Mountains. Do you suppose any of those visitors were Seventh-day Adventist? I'm sure they were, because I know I was there. <laughs> but we want to have something where we can get something out in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, to those that are coming so they can take it back home. Who knows what seeds may be planted there? Amen. Maybe something that visitors would, would uh, enjoy as one of the attractions, if you will, uh, but the Adventist church could make that presentation, whether it's something on biblical lines or obviously health lines are biblical too, but something that we could share our faith and potentially, this would be crazy, maybe have a church in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. I would love that idea. <laughs> yes. So we are wanting to do more and we're really excited to be able to partner with ASI Southern Union. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited. Gary, would you have our opening prayer? Sure, let's bow our heads. Father, we are excited to be here on this, your Sabbath day. Father, we know that you are going to bless us as you have already this week. And Father, I just ask that you be with us, be with the speaker. Send your Holy Spirit into this place today. Thank you so much for ASI. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Once again, welcome and happy Sabbath, ASI.
Some of you may be wondering what this is. This is a message carrier that takes important messages across the deserts by camelback, by horseback, or however it may go. And it is our symbol in the Middle East North Africa Union for carrying Christ's message to the world. As Adventists, we have a lot of incentives in our work, and uh, the incentives we have are strategies and beautiful programs like this one, and I have been so blessed to be part of ASI. But I have a, a question for you. The church has this beautiful program called I Will Go, but really the question is, will I go? We talk about sacrifice, and there are some important questions that every day in the Middle East that I have to wrestle with. And I want to ask you this morning for a moment to wrestle through these questions with me. How many people are you satisfied with not knowing Jesus? How long do you want to wait before Jesus comes? How many millions of people should die not knowing about the beautiful message of God's love that we know and understand? The Middle East and North Africa Union has 52 cities of at least a million population. And these 52 cities include the large cities of Istanbul, Cairo, Sorry, the clicker is struggling. Tehran, Riyadh, Dubai, Marrakesh, Erbil, Damascus. These cities have so many people in them that when you walk through them and there's not one Seventh-day Adventist in some of these places… Some of them are completely untouched by the gospel. And I want to ask the question, is that something we can be satisfied with? The Middle East and North Africa Union has 585 million people. Out of these 585 million people, 6,000 of them are Seventh-day Adventists. That means that we have… a beautiful message that's growing, but it isn't that much larger than the membership of the Loma Linda University Church spread across the 20 countries of Mena. Are you satisfied with that? Let me tell you one story, though. It's a beautiful story, one that is being repeated around Mena, a young man studying outside of his home country in Mena, and he's convicted by his sense that God is leading him, and he's looking for the true religion, the true religion that would have two characteristics, interestingly, that it would keep the commandments of God and that would also believe in salvation by faith in Jesus. And he looked at all the religions around the world. He looked at Judaism. He says, it can't be. They keep the commandments, but they don't believe in Jesus. It, 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 all these churches, they, they believe in Jesus, but they don't keep the commandments. And he eventually graduated, returned to his home country. And one day he was on the internet still searching And as he was searching, he stumbled across a message that that married these two that has the commands of God and the faith of Jesus. And he is like scales fell off his eyes, and he he got so excited. He went into his, his bathroom, and he took a bucket of water, and he baptized himself. Isn't that beautiful faith, folks? Later, he was baptized by immersion. Do not worry. He eventually found in that country a group, there is a group there of foreign students who worship there, and he was somehow able to get into a secret, locked, closed Facebook group, and he says, hi, I'm from this country, and I'd like to meet you all. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. They were terrified. They didn't know if there was somebody trying to root them out and get them out of the country or put them in jail. 
finally one of them said, okay, the, one of our missionaries there, okay, I'll meet you. And he met them at a, at a local cafe. And it, this, this uh, missionary listened to his story and he said, well, where have you ever met a Seventh-day Adventist? And, and this young man named Ishmael looked him in the face and said, you don't understand. You are the very first Seventh-day Adventist I have ever met. It's the dream of every missionary to have this conversation. But after a little time, Ishmael became discouraged, alone, and he went to the missionary and he said, isn't there others in my country like me? Isn't there someone else? Wisely, the missionary said, this is not a problem for me. This is God's problem. Let's kneel down and ask God to raise up other Ishmaels like you. They knelt down and prayed. And the missionary prayed, Lord, bring another Ishmael. Two weeks later, our media center sent a name to the missionary. He was so excited that he picked up the phone and he called Ishmael and he says, I have another one here in your country. And guess what his name is? His name is Ishmael. Now, today, in that country, there are a number of Ishmaels. <laughs> And there is a group of people who are studying with us to, to know about the soon coming of Jesus. And this story is repeated in other countries of the Middle East and North Africa. And I just want to say I praise God for what He is doing. Now, the challenge is really big. I'll be honest with you. If you look at the other divisions, North America Division, there's one Adventist for 292 people. South America Division, one for every 138. Inter-America Division, one for every 82. South Africa Indian Ocean Division, one for every 151. And in the Middle East and North Africa, we have one Adventist for every 93,000 people, my friends. I'm not satisfied with this, are you? I cannot sleep at night sometimes wondering, how will we accomplish this task? But I have to remember, this problem is not my problem. How will we finish the task? How will we do this job together? This is a God-sized problem, and I believe God has answers to that problem. But this isn't only God's problem. He's, as his people, it is our problem, right? Amen? So one serious question I have for you is, what are you doing to be involved in the most difficult places of this planet? What are you personally doing to get involved in sharing Christ's end time message with the world? In the Middle East and North Africa, we're doing everything we can we are using every creative means possible. We're using innovation and entrepreneurship to establish businesses in the Middle East, North Africa as beachheads for the Lord. We're not businessmen. We need you. We have centers of influence that are teaching English, that are kindergartens, that are doing health promotion, that are doing any number of things that are there to try to establish relationships because God is moving and the people who he's moving on their hearts need to see faces to connect with and to tell them the full message that we have. I'm really thankful for the many partners here at ASI and around the world in the World Church that help us and support the work in MENA. But our work is to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. And I have a couple questions. How can business people and supporting ministries bind together to enter the last of the cities on this planet and in the Middle East? How can business people work to establish businesses that will be lighthouses? How can you partner with the church to advance the mission of the kingdom of God? I don't know about you, but I want desperately to be God's message holder. Amen? 
to take his message to the world, and I want to invite you to be as well. If you have a desire to connect with the hard parts of the world to reach, I'm going to put a QR code. All you have to do is scan the QR code, take a picture of it with your phone. If you don't know how to do this, find somebody under the age of 40. They'll help you. Take a picture of it. And there's a little response card there. And the only reason is because people are always saying, how do I get in touch with you? And I just want to say that God is transforming lives all around the 20 countries of the Middle East and North Africa Union. And I believe for some of you, he is making an invitation today to come and be part of his message to the people of the Middle East and North Africa. There are beautiful people all around the 20 nations. It is an absolutely amazing place to work and to live. Do not bend to the fear that the news media puts out, but remember the greatest thing we have is a message to share with the world. It's our privilege this morning to share this beautiful song in Spanish. Hopefully the words will come translated in English. My wife does not speak English very well. The glory be to our Lord, Jehovah, the Lord of heavens.
Jehová, Señor de los cielos, luz del camino eterno. You know, less than six months ago, our hearts broke as we saw what was going on with the war that broke out with the Ukrainians. And our hearts were looking for what could we do to help them in this crisis. And so we got together and we decided, what could we do, Dan, to uh, help them? Well, one of the things we learned from hearing some of the early reports from Steve Dickman and some of the group from OCI was that as people would come by, the publishing people had put out magazines, uh, Steps to Christ and so on, and water. And as they came by, they wanted the magazines rather than the water, because they had water. And so we said, we need to do something that tells the story of Jesus and that let, gives people hope spiritually. So we decided we needed to create something. And uh, what happened is, is that we said, okay, we need a little kids book. Well, we had actually created one of those with Sandy Duran. Dr. Sandy Duran is, is, an, is a creator of some books and, and material on Three Angels Messages. I called her right after we had that phone call where our planning group got together and I said, I need a 24-page book targeted for a 10-year-old Ukrainian refugee child. And she said, well, let me think about it. Well, the next, and then shortly after that, I made another phone call uh, to Lars Justinen. Lars is an Adventist artist illustrator, does all the work on the um, Sabbath school quarterlies. And I said, Lars, here's our situation. He said, well, send me the script. Let me look at it. So Sandy, the next morning, I, that was Wednesday night, I, she works in Florida. I work in California. So by the time I get up, she's already been going for three hours. And there on my email was a perfect script for a full 24-page book. And so I sent it to Lars and he said, wow, this is good. And so he actually took that and created 15 brand new original illustrations, spent most of the night doing that, several nights in a row. And we actually had that book finished and ready to go to press within just a matter of days. Pastor Mark Finley also began to write some articles for adults. We took that and turned it into, into a magazine uh, in which you'll, I think they have some pictures that'll come up in a moment. But we had the book for kids and a magazine for adults. And we literally, between the, those two individuals I mentioned, plus my friend Mark Bond, designer, he put that stuff together. And we actually had them on press in Poland at Springs of Life, um, uh, our ministry there. They have a printing press. And those were on press within two weeks and two days. Amen. And Amen. Uh, then Denzel would take it from there. Or a Brian. Brian, I guess. <laughs> okay. Well, I had the opportunity to go with Pastor Finley and Denzel, too, actually, to Poland and to Hungary. We didn't go into Ukraine at that point, but over 2 million refugees had <clears throat> fled um, just into Poland and were being housed by church members and in churches. We had the opportunity to interview many. I think Denzel and I together uh, taped over six hours of, of testimonies and just powerful stories that we heard. Um, just very life transforming. Um, we did go actually and visit the press that you're talking about. They're ASI members and miraculously, they have been storing paper for the last year, not knowing exactly why, but when presses even all around the United States here, they can't print something in two weeks. It was truly a miracle that they were able to do that. Um, I was impressed with the fact that the refugees that came, um, they never thought that, that uh, Russia was going to invade. They just kept putting it off, putting it off. It was just business as usual right up to the very day of the invasion. And it kind of reminded me of the times that we live in, that people think this is just going to keep going on and life as usual until all of a sudden things change overnight. It was just a radical shift. So many of these people just fled with very little, just a handbag. Some of them waited for a week just to get across the border. Um, it, um, so they're truly refugees. I was impressed that the Seventh-day Adventist refugees, a few of them talked about losing their faith, but for most of them, this strengthened their faith. It showed what they had. And in fact, in some of the churches that we visited in Poland and Hungary, uh, the pastor stated that the refugees actually came and encouraged their congregations and their faith has been strengthened because of the faith of the refugees. Um, we could tell so many just horrible stories. I think Denzel will share one of a, of a refugee, but just uh, real quick, 
um, the churches were housing refugees, and there was a pastor that I had an opportunity to counsel with who had been taking care, he and his wife had been taking care of refugees uh, literally 24-7. They were taking care of their needs, they were counseling with them, they were hearing these horrific stories, um, children watching their fathers being shot in front of them just day after day, hearing the, the worst stories imaginable from war. And uh, Pastor had actually come to the point where he had been admitted to a mental hospital after he could not get out of bed, just curled up in a fetal position. And when we were there for the meetings, um, he was able to get a day pass out of the hospital to come back to the church. And uh, he really appreciated the meetings, but I had the opportunity to counsel with him for over an hour and a half through a translator. And just encouraged him that, look, you cannot carry the weight of the world on your shoulders alone. You've got to engage your congregation, but you've got to take time for yourself. You've got to start reading the Bible again. And I encouraged him to read the Psalms, especially Psalms 22. Encouraged him that Jesus knows what depression is like. He's experienced it. And encouraged him to take time. And little by little, over the next few days, he'd stop me and say, oh, Dr. Schwartz, I, I just spent an hour in the park with my wife. Oh, Dr. Schwartz, I just came back from the gym. And by the end of the week, he was smiling. I actually saw him just a couple weeks ago, and he was just really enthusiastic and encouraged again. And I just realized, you know, if that was the only reason I went, it was just to be a counsel to him, it was worth it. It was life transforming. Amen. Well, I want to thank the ASI family. They came together not only with their prayers, but also their financial support. And to date, we have printed and distributed over 12 million pages of religious materials for the Ukrainian refugees. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank each and every one of you for, the, for, the, for your support. But also, I want to tell you a story. I met this lady who is in an area of the cities that you saw on the news where their whole, every, the whole city was leveled. Her apartment and one other apartment are the only two left standing. She's a Seventh-day Adventist. She stayed in the basement with 160 people. I asked her, she said it was cold. I asked her how cold it was. She said it was so cold that you could see your breath. People that were in that basement were dying because of fear because she stayed there for 21 days with bombs going off all the time. And when she said that, um, she, but what she did is she set one side of the room aside and prayed and read the Bible. And that became the, the, the area of prayer. She finally got out, to make a long story short, she was getting ready to leave and go visit her daughter. And my heart was just touched by, our hearts were just touched by what she had gone through. And, when, and I asked her, as I helped her carry her single piece of luggage with all her earthly possessions, I asked her, was there anything we could help you with? Is there anything you need? And she looked at me and says, no, but if you would like to help, my daughter has a ministry in Brazil and you could help her ministry in Brazil. Here's a lady who had given up everything. She had all her earthly possessions was in one suitcase and she was worried about ministry to, to other people in other countries. It really uh, touched my heart. The purpose of our going was to inspire hope. We sensed that there were two groups of people that really needed hope. One were the refugees, second our church members. Our church members reached out in love and kindness. Seventh-day Adventist churches became refugee centers, pastors and their wives feeding people hallways in the churches that became bedrooms and little cubicles that were put there. In some churches, they took the pews out and put beds in the sanctuary. So we knew that our people needed encouragement. We also knew that the refugees needed encouragement. In the mornings, we spent with our pastors sharing hope, encouragement, sharing how they could minister to the refugees. In the afternoons, we met with groups of refugees, and then in the evenings, we had meetings for the public, both our church members and the refugees in Poland. We had one meeting in Polish and one meeting in Ukrainian. In Ukrainian. My wife, Tini, did health lectures via TV in Poland and then live health lectures in Hungary. That was a great attraction. I spoke each evening on some different aspect of hope. One of the things that we did that I think was really significant, it was very difficult at first. We brought groups of refugees together, anywhere from 15 to 30, 40, 
and we had them share their stories. Many of these refugees didn't know one another. And it was difficult for them to share at first because you can imagine women who've seen children murdered, women who've, seen, who've left their husbands behind, people that have seen bombs going off, the trauma, the emotional trauma. But as they began to share, they shared their faith in Christ. They shared their belief that there was a better day coming in the second coming of Christ beyond war, suffering, heartache, and death. We were at our college at Port Kavaleshna outside of Warsaw, and I had a group of refugees, and my translator was a professor who had been at our school at Busha in Ukraine and who had gotten out during that attack. And as the refugees were telling the story, my translator elbowed me and he said, Pastor Mark, I need to tell my story. And he told how he left the college there with three other ladies that were teaching. And he said, you've got five minutes to pack your things. We've got to get out. And they went through seven checkpoints. He said, at every checkpoint, there were guards with AK-47s. He said, you didn't know whether you're going to live or die. He said, I came to one checkpoint, and there were two young Russian soldiers there. And as I came to that particular checkpoint, I thought, this could be it. They said, get out of your car. We got out. One of them had an AK-47. He said, I looked at that young man. He was about 17 years old. He said, go around to the back of your car and open your trunk. And the professor said before our group of refugees, he said, I thought my life was going to be over then. And he said, God put a thought in my mind. It was very unusual. He said, I looked at the young man, a young man that could have been my son. I looked him in the eyes and I said, son, someday this war is going to be over. And when it's over, don't do anything that would embarrass your mother. Don't do anything that your mother would be disappointed on. The young man said, shut your trunk, get in the car, and go on. <laughs> Sometimes, when we're in crisis situations, God puts the right words in our mind. In spite of the horror, the difficulty, the agony, the pain of war, one thing we saw was a deep abiding faith on the part of our refugees and the love of Christ in the part of our members. Amen. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, ASI. It was interview season for medical students around this country in the fall of 2007. And I walked up to our office suite and there was, an, we have a, a board with all the medical students from around the country who will be interviewing in our program for that particular day. And I saw a name on the board, T.J. Knudsen. There was only one T.J. Knudsen in the world that I was aware of, and it was the son of my classmate, Tom Knudsen, and his wife, Sue, who was born to them January 2, 1981, our third year of medical school. I met him and I said, by any chance, would you be the son of my classmate, Tom Knudsen? And he said, yes. I told him that I knew him since he was in the womb of his mom, Sue. 26 and a half years later, TJ was walking into our offices. He currently is an emergency medicine physician practicing in the uh, central California area around Redding. And um, typically for Sabbath school time, we usually go over the Sabbath school lesson and this quarter is in the crucible with Christ. It is one thing to speak theoretically about suffering. It's another to have the faith of Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Faith that is tried in the fire. Our speaker today, Dr. T.J. Knudsen, has been in the crucible with Christ. I will not take away from his story, but will let, him, let you hear it in his own words. After this special music, the next voice you will hear is the voice of Dr. T.J. Knudsen.
Happy Sabbath. What a privilege it is to be here and to be able to experience God working miracles even still today. I don't know how your family got here. I'll tell you how mine got here. 
large-hearted friends of ASI, two outstanding pilots, an airplane, two forklifts, and many prayers. It's a privilege to be here with you today, and I just want to ask one more time for God to just put his words in my mouth if you would join me in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be your sons and daughters, and I pray, Lord, that even now, that you would put your words in my mouth and go before me. And I pray for each one of these people here who are listening, that they would hear a word from you in due season, that you would be glorified in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, the title for this uh, talk is Trusting Him Still with the subheading coming forth as gold. And I want to put at the outlay of this a quotation found in the book Desire of Ages, page 224, paragraph 5, that I want you to be considering for your own life as we have considered it for ours. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning. <clears throat> God's appointed way for conveying the good news and the gospel to those around us is found in Ministry of Healing, page 100 in paragraph 2. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old, but that which is, will be most effectual is the testimony of our own spirit, of our own experience. That experience is what I am here to share with you today. And um, just by way of background, a little bit about me, since I don't know many of you, but I grew up and was raised in Southern California in a Seventh-day Adventist home with two loving parents and two younger brothers. I attended Southern for my undergraduate years, and I was glad I did because it was there that I met my wife, Mary Ann. We married a couple of years later when I was in Loma Linda University for School of Medicine during my second year. And then afterwards, we played the... Uh, medical school lottery and got assigned to a residency in Michigan where we were in Kalamazoo for three years and then we've been in Northern California since. We have four children um, that we had, two in Michigan, two in California. And um, the, 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 the prelude for the story really begins with another story and how God prepared us and we allowed him to lead and prepare us uh, as we started raising a family that we wanted more than anything to have all of our children ready to meet the Lord in peace, ready for heaven, ready to do work for the master. And so God began to grow us. He has a way that he wishes to instruct each and every one of us. And primarily that is found in the pages of scripture, his revealed word to us. And as we talk to him and he talks to us. <clears throat> God began to grow our family, and I am grateful, so grateful, that he was an intimate and important part in forming the marriage that we had, because my wife and I are like-minded, and I praise God for that. What God taught us, we decided that we want to do, not just be hearers of the word, but doers, and as he would teach us, as he would lead us, as he would point out something, you could do this better. You could do this different. We wanted to be the people. We wanted to be the parents that would say, yes, Lord. No steel toe boots. If our toes get stepped on, adjust our steps accordingly. And so as God started taking us through this uh, growing period, we grew, of course, as we got married, as we had kids, during residency. But there was also spiritual growth that was taking place also. And the next lesson that he had after we had had our first child was God began to put a greater, uh, he, he gave us a greater understanding of how he wanted us to live healthy lives. And why does God want us to have healthy lives? So we can have a mind that can think clearly. And why would he want us to have minds that can think clearly? So we can hear him speaking to us. Because we cannot afford to have cloudy or severed communication with heaven at this time. And so I want to put up in, and put before you in the book Ministry of Healing, page 128, paragraph 3, this quotation which changed how we viewed uh, God speaking to us. Whatever injures the health not only lessens physical vigor, 
but tends to weaken the mental and moral powers. Indulgence in any unhealthful practice makes it more difficult for one to discriminate between right and wrong, and hence more difficult to resist evil. So as I read that, we became impressed. Does our physical health have any bearing on our spiritual health, yes or no? Yes. So our health decisions, moral decisions, is it going to make it um, more easy to hear the word of God speaking to us or not? So physical and health decisions do have moral implications. After medical school and residency and two years into practice, I became convinced that the vast majority of what I saw as an ER physician in the ER was preventable. Probably between 80 and 90% is preventable if you realize that a lot of the reasons people come for heart disease, stroke, wound complications, so on and so forth, that's due to underlying health problems that are usually preventable. Um, probably more than half of the traumas are influenced by drugs or alcohol in some way. That could be preventable. And so it was then that I started feeling a strong burden to be more purposeful in how I would interact with patients. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I have decided I'm going to try my best with God's help to put myself out of business. I know I won't be successful this side of heaven, but I try and I tell patients that my desire for you is that you would never have to come to the emergency room again. And I timidly started doing it at first. I timidly started you know, pointing people to now mainstream resources that all come to the same conclusion of what God originally gave for the, for the prescription for health in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Um, but then I became uh, a little bit troubled as I told people that they should watch the documentary Forks Over Knives and other things that would better their health and that, you know, that information ultimately came from God. And I don't want to be a plagiarist and give them God's wisdom without letting them know this came from God. And so... Little by little, um, God helped, helped me to understand how I could do that and realize that, you know, if I'm going to give people health counsel, if I'm going to point them to one of these things, I will not do it unless I somehow point them that this information, it came from God and that he was the author of good health, that he was the author of a plant-based diet, that he was the one who said that there was a way to eat to be healthy, to drink to be healthy, to live to be healthy, to dress to be healthy, so on and so forth. And so working in the ER under these conditions became fairly, um, uh, had a lot of practice and became fairly adept at giving a five minute health nugget, often accompanied with a magazine or a book. Now, <clears throat> the health message not only impacted how I interacted with patients at work, but it impacted my wife and I, especially at home. And probably the biggest growing point that we had was when we had our first child. Because now we had someone that was watching our every move. And we had to decide as we were gonna raise them, are we gonna be double standard parents or not? Are we gonna be able to uh, tell them that what is good for you is also good for us? What is healthy for you to eat and drink is the same thing that is healthy for us to eat and drink. And so we started to uh, check ourselves in a proverbial mirror to make sure that we would not have to have the complicated experience of later explaining to the kids, this is fine for adults, but not for you. The gems of truth that we found as we studied more into this and read from the books, Ministry of Healing, Child Guidance, Adventist Home, have been a gift without price. I only wish that I had read them sooner. So God was educating us, and as we learned that there are healthy ways of eating, living, and dressing, we, uh, we, our family got excited about sharing this with others. At church, dinner with the doctors, health nuggets, health lectures, incorporating into sermons that we would occasionally share. Uh, God had also blessed our family, especially through my wife, with musical talent, which was being developed at this time. She could play the piano and um, could play by ear. Anything she heard, she could play. And it was just something that was such a blessing to me especially, but also to those who we were able to minister to. 
But the next thing that God decided that he was going to teach us after we had learned uh, <clears throat> how to more better value our health was, are you living where he wants you to? Country Living. This is a book that had another profound impact on our family. We read the book, Country Living. We prayed that the Lord would lead us. We decided this is how we want to raise our family. And we prayed for two years. God, how are you going to make this happen? We're saddled with debt. We you know, don't know how to start. We have two kids. We're living in a suburban area. Show us the way. And like God, he often shows you the way in an unexpected manner. After praying for two months, Marianne was pregnant with our fourth child, about five months along, and we got a knock on the door. And it was our landlords saying, we love you, you've been good renters, we need the place back, you have 60 days, get out of here. So Marianne being pregnant, five months, and us also being slated for another major commitment uh, with presenting some uh, family and health related stuff on the other side of the country, um, it was a faith building experience as God took us rapidly out into the country. Much prayer, several miracles, looking, and then God led us to a place that we had total peace about, and we moved. Right after we moved, we had our fourth child, and we discovered that the threefold reason that we found why God wanted us out there was number one, character development and being better able to hear him speak to you. The less you are surrounded by the artificial, the more you are surrounded by the things of, the, of, of, the, of nature, the things that God has created, you become more able to hear when God is trying to speak to you through a still small voice. We're told in Isaiah, and you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Uh, number two, practical usefulness. There's practical reasons uh, that God wants us to be living out in the country, not the least of which is the ability to grow food and promote optimal health. These last two or three years have certainly give ever, given everyone a wake-up call that there is great uncertainty in the world around us. Number three, be, being prepared by obedience to God for the coming crisis, which we know is even starting to unfold and be situated to be a blessing to others when that time comes. So God is taking us through this experience, educating us on how to live, educating us where to live. Are you willing to follow? Are we willing to follow? And so after he had taught us those lessons, it was time for the next lesson. And that was problems and trouble that we were experiencing at some of our local churches. We faced some interesting situations uh, which found us to be in a state of, of perplexity and not knowing exactly what to do. And it was about that time that God laid a very strong burden of our heart. You know those books, Testimonies for the Church? It was his intention that his church read them. And his church is not a building, and it's not just clergy or pastors, it is every single person, every one of us. Testimonies for you, testimonies for me. And so my wife and I, we decided we're gonna put outside reading on hold, and we are going to read these nine volumes through, cover to cover, in order, and see what God would do. And it was uncanny. The problems didn't go away, but as they came, as we were reading through them systematically, one by one, whenever a problem would come, the very next thing that I would read would address the problem and give wisdom and give insight how to navigate through it. It was uncanny how that would play out. And I think that probably one of the most impactful sections that I read, if you don't make a covenant with God to go home and read all nine, I want you to go home and at least read in volume three, there's a section called Moses and Aaron, which stands out to me probably the most out of everything that I read. Because it was in this section that I, we learned that the way God sees and the way that man sees are two totally different things. Israel had multiple times where they got into trouble, yes or no. They were faithful to God sometimes, unfaithful to him most of the time. And in that section, I read that there were two people that were preeminently put before us as an example. One was Moses, one was Aaron. 
both men of God, but the people unitedly said, Aaron is the Christian. Aaron is the one that the people were charmed by. And they were disgusted, to quote, with the rashness and anger of Moses. But God sees not as man sees. He condemned not the ardor and indignation of Moses against the apostasy of Israel. And so it was between us starting the beginning of volume one and volume nine that the rest of the story takes place. The theme for this ASI is united, transformed, and sent. I believe that if every one of us read the testimonies and heed them, that will put us in a condition to be united in a favorable way. Because there, there are two ways that people were united in the Bible. They were united around the golden calf, bad united. They were also united in the upper room, good united. So to be united, it needs to be on a firm foundation. And God, in leading us through this, he gave us a preparation that we would find ourselves in great need of not long after. <clears throat> after we were on this uh, journey, providentially moving to the country, after praying for a, co a country property, and God answering the prayer, my wife and I came under simultaneous conviction to leave it, put it up for sale, and move. Where to? We didn't know, but the conviction was so strong, and it happened at the same time, and it happened to both of us, that we decided, well, we've been saying yes to God, we're gonna keep saying yes. Abraham and Isaac come to mind. So, we decided to move out in faith. We said, well, we'll just put the house up for sale, price it a little high, do for sale by owner, I'm sure nothing will happen. Within three days, someone came and knocked on our door and we were in escrow. Now, we started having to explain things to other people. I had to put a notice at work. I started saying my goodbyes at work. We were explaining to friends and relatives that we were moving. They asked where. We said, we don't know. I said, you put your house up for sale? Yes, we did. Someone bought it already? Yes, they did. And there was no reason that made logical sense to it. Other than that, God had spoken. Was there any logical reason why Abraham should take Isaac to a mountain far away and kill him? No, no. Well, what happened because of this? I put in my notice at work. I would loved working there for about seven or eight years. I had a great rapport with the coworkers. I started saying my goodbyes. Knowing that I was gonna be leaving gives you added boldness in your witnessing. And so as I was getting ready to say goodbye, I wrapped up 80 great controversies, typed up a letter um, by way of um, appreciation for each and every one of them that I worked with them and started handing them out. I had my last shift and just before my last shift, the escrow fell out due to a technicality. But we still were going on a trip. I'd put in my notice and I was able to accomplish something that I had been trying for years to do and that was to work less. When you're working full time, it's hard to work less. But if you quit and then give yourself back as available part time, we were able to accomplish, uh, we were able to accomplish this. And so everything worked out in a way that we saw clearly that God was leading. He answered a prayer for a country property he gave us a miracle in giving it to us and then said, would you be willing to give it up? What has God given you that you might be asked to give up? I want you to think on that, Abraham and Isaac. So what were the blessings that came out of this? A technical glitch, the escrow fell through. The place stayed ours, we're still there. The, move, the burden to move has been totally removed. It was clearly a test that God just wanted to take us through. What else, was it, what else was a blessing that happened because of it? Well, because I quit my job, we took advantage of that, being off the schedule, to take a two and a half month family trip. It was beautiful. Family time, quality, we drove across the country and back. 
a rich time where we went to national parks, we were passing out uh, literature, health, um, um, great controversies, health magazines, having discussions with people uh, in a recreational setting. People have time and leisure. And most importantly, being able to spend extra quality time with our kids and my wife doing the activities we love, hiking, camping, and traveling, not knowing what was just around the corner. I want to direct your, uh, your attention to a quotation from the book My Life Today, page 92, which says, a refining, purifying process is going on among the people of God, and the Lord of hosts has sent his hand to this work. This process is most trying to the soul, but it is necessary in order that defilement may be removed. Trials are essential. Trials are what? Essential in order that we may be brought close to our Heavenly Father. And skipping on down, the purification of God's people cannot be accomplished without suffering. This picture that you see on there was taken on that day at that time, just over three years ago. Less than 24 hours later, our world was about to be turned completely upside down. <clears throat> Next day, July 28, 2019, I went in for my 10 o'clock shift, was 30 minutes into it, seen a couple of patients when the trauma radio sounded, which said that there had been a motor vehicle accident on Whitmore Road with an 1144. As soon as I heard that, I became nervous because I knew that my wife and kids were gonna be coming in shortly after me to do a routine uh, food pickup drop with our, um, with our Azure standard pickup. Nervously, I called my wife on her phone and I got no answer. And then I called home where my sister-in-law answered the phone and said, oh yeah, Marianne and the girls, they just left about 15 minutes ago. We called out to EMS and uh, on a private phone and we asked them to make and model the vehicle and we found out that it was ours. So knowing that, there, that my family had been in an auto accident and that someone had died, it was then an, a horrific waiting game as the next few minutes played out. There was no way to know who until I knew who the ambulances were bringing in to me at work. The first one came in, it was a 35-year-old female who appears to have a neck injury, appears to be probably paralyzed, but otherwise had stable vital signs. So I knew that was Mary Ann. There's a five-year-old coming in in the next ambulance who appears to be fine, has some scrapes and bruises, but otherwise seems to be doing okay. And then the third one was, there's a three-year-old female coming in with an obvious femur deformity, uh, but otherwise vital signs are stable. And it was at that time that I knew it was our firstborn child, our daughter, who had died. <clears throat> I will never forget the, that day or the conversations I had as long as my mind is with me. And the outflow of support and concern and love from my coworkers, I will be ever grateful for. Um, someone threw out a SOS, a text and phone call, and within about 15 minutes, four doctors, dozens of nurses, and a whole bunch of other ancillary staff showed up. I was relieved of my duties, and I was then just waiting for them to arrive. Marianne was the first one to arrive uh, by helicopter, and um, I went out to the helicopter landing pad and saw her, and she was awake talking and said, TJ, I'm so glad you're here, I can't breathe. And I could just one look at her, I was like, oh dear God, she is very, very, very paralyzed. <clears throat> um, that day was a blur, but it was one that I will remember. And I want to draw your attention to this quotation, Our High Calling, page 323 on the slide, which says, our Heavenly Father measures and weighs every trial before he permits it to come upon the believer. He considers the circumstances and the strength of the one who is to stand under the proving and test of God, and he never permits the temptations to be greater than the capacity of resistance. Friends, I want you to remember that when your trial comes, and you're probably already in it, many of you. God weighs it before he allows it to come to you, and he will give strength to see it through. If you could advance the side, slide, please. <clears throat> 
I don't know of anything that can be more painful than burying your firstborn child. Unless it's leaving your paralyzed wife in the ICU who is not sedated, mentally sharp, and, but still cannot speak because she has a tracheostomy tube in her neck and she can't uh, voice what she needs. And driving two and a half hours away, carrying your almost four-year-old in a body cast to go do it. But I was comforted with this verse in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, which says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. I want to tell you a little bit about our precious Sierra. <clears throat> We're told in Great Controversy, page 621, paragraph 1, God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. Sierra was our firstborn. She died a month and a half before turning 10. She was quite a reader. Before the age of 10, she had read the Bible through cover to cover. Messages to young people, cover to cover. Multiple other books, playing the piano and violin by ear, composing original pieces. She could make a meal, could change the baby's diaper, bathe the baby, dress the baby, tuck in the baby. She loved babies. And she left a memorable phone message on my wife's phone one time asking if we could please have another baby. She even promised that she would be good for nine months. <laughs> she was a health reformer in the fullest sense of the word. First sign of sickness, not Tylenol and Motrin, nope. Out came the raw garlic, onion, hot and cold showers. <clears throat> and um, it was something that, it was a joy and a privilege to have been able to have her entrusted to our family for the time which we did. Our sweet Sierra, she was a medical missionary, and as she was this voracious reader, she was one of those kids that you said, you have to go outside and play before you can read. Some kids, you have to read before you go out and play. She was the exact opposite. <clears throat> but even a child is known by his or her doings. That's found in Proverbs 20, verse 11. And these are some, these are some of the books that Sierra had read through. And um, taking God at his word, she would often come up to us, Mom and Dad, I just read that we shouldn't eat between meals. That's not good for our health. You're right, Sierra. Where'd you read that? In this book. Mom and Dad, I read in this book that we shouldn't drink tea, coffee, or alcohol. You're right, Sierra. It's habit forming, it's addictive, and it compromises your health. Mom and Dad, I just read in this book we shouldn't eat cheese, refined sugar, or other harmful spices. You're right, Sierra. Do you think that we should live this, live this way as a family? And, or do you think that we should ignore it? Mom and Dad, I just read that we shouldn't combine milk, eggs, and sugar in our baking. It clogs the system. It makes us peevish. I love that word. <laughs> Mom and Dad, I just read the real story behind Christmas, Easter, and Halloween. We as Christians shouldn't celebrate those holidays at all. Well, Sierra, they are right. They are all pagan in origin. Let's see if we can figure out a way that we can do some evangelism through them and do something uh, more wholesome instead. Mom and Dad, I just read that... Uh, I, or Mom and Dad, how come more people don't want to move to the country? I just read Country Living. How come everyone doesn't want to move to the country? Well, Sierra, send them the book, send them a prayer, ask them once and no more, and then let the Lord work on their heart. Train up a child in the way he should go and they will likely sharpen and train you along the way. I want to let her speak to us now with a short video, if you could please roll it, as she, uh, this is something we recorded on her. I'm building my health house. I'm building my health house day by day as I eat and sleep and work and play. My food is the lumber that I use and the best of materials I must choose, such as fruits, grains, nuts and vegetables while fresh air furnishes the boards and nails then sleep the carpenter takes them all and silently fashions each room and hall if i build a right when i am old i'll have a health house i'm proud to hold no need for breakdowns or repairs for good material wears and wears so i'm building my health house day by day as i eat and sleep and work and play some build for happiness, some build for wealth, but I'll find them all in my house of health.
um, grieving the loss of our child was uh, a balancing act because we also had an ongoing tragedy with the family with my wife's injury and Trinity being in a body cast. And so the verse that comes to mind in Exodus chapter 14, verse 15, and the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. And so that's what we did. Six weeks we were at UC Davis. After that, um, the Lord opened the way for us to go have a rehab stay for two months out in Denver, out at Craig Hospital. And um, while we were there, we got Marianne, uh, we transferred our, our home base out there. We're eternally grateful for the many acts of kindness that were shown to us while we were there by so many people, some of which we knew and hadn't seen for a long time, many people, perfect strangers. But during this time, it was just amazing to experience the family of God in action. But as we got there, the entire six weeks that we had been at UC Davis, I hadn't heard Marianne speak a word. She was uh, totally with it. I had to read lips. It was uh, very difficult. But um, I want to now, this is the first time I heard her. And I want to just roll this video as you look at that memory, as you look at that verse in Psalms 89, verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, and with my mouth make known thy faithfulness to all generation. If you could roll that video, please. Hi everyone, I'm so happy today because I'm talking, so exciting. I've been at Craig Hospital or Rehab for two days and things are moving right along. So praise the Lord, thank you all for your continued love and prayers. It's my great, with great joy that I get to uh, let her come on up here on the stage with me now and speak a few words with you also. I just want to praise God that I can speak today, honey. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And And you know, one of my favorite Bible verses has always been, and they, they that love the Lord spake often one to another. You know that one? <laughs> and I know my honey, my uh, TJ's favorite verse is what, honey? Even a fool when he keeps his silence, even a fool is kind of wise when he holds his peace. <laughs> we have a little joke that way, but- She's the talker, <laughs> I am not. I know none of you can relate to that, right? But that the day I talked, TJ, you, it touched your heart and we're just so grateful. You know, a lot of things you take for granted in life and it's not until you lose it that you're thankful for it. But uh, what a wonderful thing today to uh, thank God for what you have before you lose it. Why not try that? Thank God for the health you have, the marriage you have, the family you have, everything. You know, I used to think you, you, well, you've probably heard some of these sayings. You know, you think you're a good teacher until you get students. You think you're a good parent until you get children, right? Well, my little saying now is, you know, honey, I thought I was a good Christian until I got in a wheelchair. And I've had to learn how to be a Christian all over again in a wheelchair, right? You know, it's difficult um, being in a wheelchair going, from um, enjoying serving and working for the Lord, climbing mountains, being active, all those types of things, and to be put in a wheelchair. My um, dad gave me a card before my accident, said, um, happy birthday to my daughter who's a dynamite in a dress. And I said, well, Lord, how's this gonna go taking a stick of dynamite and putting me in a wheelchair? <laughs> Not real good, right? But um, God has taught me so many beautiful lessons throughout this whole journey. And one scripture I want to say, Psalms 71. Now that I have my voice back, I want to praise God with my life. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day long. Amen. Praise God. And I want to call my children out at this time. This has been a family journey that we've been on. 
not just for me, but for dear TJ and also for our children. God has taught us many things as we've gone through it all. And you know what, brothers and sisters, we're in the middle of it. It's not over, and uh, it's in the trenches some days, huh, kids, at home? And it's difficult and tough, but we've learned things. Bryson, what has God taught you through this trial and tragedy that we've gone through so far? God has taught me endurance. Endurance versus giving up. The inward strength to withstand stress to accomplish God's best. Amen. And you had a quote that you put to memory too to help you with that, right? Yeah, it says, we are soldiers of Christ and those who enlist in his army are expected to do difficult work, work which will tax their energies to the utmost. We must understand that a soldier's life is one of aggressive warfare, of perseverance and endurance. For Christ's sake, we are to endure trials. We are not engaged in mimic battles. Amen. Whitney, what has Jesus taught you through this? God has taught me patience. Patience versus restlessness. Accepting a difficult situation from God without giving him a deadline to remove it. Amen. And dear Trinity, what has Jesus taught you? Jesus has taught me obedience. Obedience. Obedience versus willfulness. Doing what I've been asked to do quickly, cheerfully, and precisely. Amen. Children, thank you for sharing. And, you know, we just want to, um, I, I just want to share one thing God's taught me too along the line. Character training at its finest. Wisdom. Wisdom is seeing and responding to life situations from God's frame of reference. You know, we can go through... Um, so much in life, and it's sometimes hard to understand what's happening and why. But when we can see things from God's viewpoint, it's very, very helpful. You realize that, that He is working and He is moving. You know, I'm so thankful that as a young girl, my dad taught me um, that God will often use negative circumstances to teach you. Marianne. And so um, when there was the grumpy person at church um, who rebuked us young people or this or that, I didn't shy away from that. I said, I want to learn. And so it was before the accident. Um, I always wanted to be a learner in life and be, be taught by God. And I'm so thankful for all the lessons that he's taught me and that um, before the accident that I was walking with Christ, I was close to him. Our family was really purposing to raise our kid, children for heaven, as you've already heard. And, but then when the tragedy happened and I woke up in the car to my body contorted in a new position, Trinity crying in the back, screaming, crying, um, Whitney, I could see her feet walking around asking the gentleman for help who we had passed and then the tire uh, blowing out in the vehicle, taking us off the road. Um, you know, all of that happened and I didn't know what happened to Sierra at the time, but I realized, um, I realized that at that moment in time, God spared my life. Why? Well, wh why did God spare my life? Well, I believe that he wants me here on this earth to learn the lessons he has for me and encourage as many people heavenward as I can. I want to share this scripture or this poem. It's really encouraged me. There is a peace that cometh after sorrow of hope surrendered, not of hope fulfilled. A peace that looketh not upon tomorrow, but calmly on the tempest that is still. A peace that does not live in joys, excesses, nor in the happy life of love secure, but an unfailing strength the heart possesses. 
from conflicts won while learning to endure. A peace there is in sacrifice secluded, a life subdued from will and passion free. Tis not the peace that over Eden brooded, but that which triumphed in Gethsemane. You know, I've had to learn to give all my expectations every day to God, to surrender all my plans and everything to Him. I thought God might want it to uh, be different, right, TJ? And that we would be on the front lines for the Lord, doing a lot of, a lot of work for Him. But God had different plans, and we've had to surrender that to Him. There's a beautiful, a beautiful quote, thank you, honey, that I want to share. God in his great love is seeking to develop in us the precious graces of his spirit. He permits us to encounter obstacles, persecution, hardships, not as a curse, but as the greatest blessing of our lives. Every temptation resisted, every trial bravely borne, gives us a new experience and advances us in advances us in the in the um the cut off it advances us in the work of character building the soul that through divine power resists temptation reveals to the world and to the heavenly universe the efficiency of the grace of Christ you know this is my water forgive me you know, it is a testimony how God has kept me each and every day. And I just have to say it. I am not on any antidepressants. I'm not traumatized to get in a car. The Lord has helped me through all of that. And I praise his name. And I know each one of you are going through so many things, so many heartaches or trials of your own. You might feel like you're in the trenches too. And there's no one applauding. It's just you and the good Lord, right? And to be faithful. Don't give up. And God will help you. And um, he will give you a strength and comfort every day to carry you through and see you through. I've learned to wrestle with the Lord. And I've had long nights and long days wrestling with the Lord. But take hold of him and say, Father, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you give me the strength that I need. And um, I just have to say, TJ, I thank God for you. You've been a faithful husband. Husbands, I want to encourage you to love your wives. And may God bless your marriages, your families. Don't give up. And may you continue to draw strength from Christ that you need to make it. In the closing minute, I just want to draw your attention to the slide in Job 23.10, which reads, But he knoweth the way that I take, but when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. There's a photograph somewhere on there uh, that... Um, was taken after the accident. The same location that we were able to take our family to the day before the accident uh, at one of our favorite places there. But our final appeal that we want to leave each one of you with is several fold. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and that is the return of Christ is near. Your close of probation is nearer. You have no idea what is going to happen when each day starts and you get in a car. Secondly, I want you to remember to read and heed the testimonies. Embrace the entire health message and plan that God has given to each one of us. Make sure that you are living where and how you should. If you could keep advancing the slides to keep up, please. <clears throat> Spreading the literature like the leaves of autumn, especially the ones that speak to this time. Hold on to Christ no matter what happens. As Peter said, to whom shall we go? Advance it a couple of more. And lastly, remember this, that your greatest trial 
may end up being your biggest blessing. With that, we leave you. God bless you. And we just wish you all of God's best as you stay faithful to him in the coming trials that you will face by his grace. God bless you, each one. Praise God. What a wonderful program this morning by TJ. If you were blessed, can you say amen? amen. If you were really blessed, can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Sometimes our greatest trial can become our greatest blessing. Can we say amen? Amen. Uh, as we get ready to close the program today, uh, just a few announcements. We want you to know there'll actually be no baptism this afternoon at 3, uh, so you don't have to uh, worry about that. And then we want you to know as well that we'll be taking a short break, uh, about a 20-minute break, and then Divine Hour service will start back promptly at 10.45 uh, p.m. And so to our online viewers, thank you so much for joining in today. Uh, we love you, and we'll look forward to seeing you back here very shortly at 10.45. Let's just bow our heads and pray as we close out our Sabbath school. Father God, we thank you for this awesome program. We thank you for the inspiring story of Rick McEdwards and of TJ and his family. We pray that we will take these things and hang it on the lines of our minds and let the Holy Ghost blow on it, that we would truly be revived to witness, united, transformed, and sent. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.